How are you? Good, so, thank you. So, Sensi's roles are teens, of course. How will this, their emotions, their normal teen emotions, um, play into them carrying out their mission? The emotionality of every character is actually what every scene in the entire series is grounded in. So even though it might be slightly heightened at all, all of the emotions are actually grounded in. And so all of the uh, reactions will be real, none of it will be heightened. All of it is coming from a real, genuine, grounded teenage space. How did you first discover the comic books? First, um, I knew of the comic books and I had read one when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I saw the show was getting um, picked up as a writer in Hollywood, you try to stay current on everything that's being developed. And I, I go deeper into the books and having uh, been around that age in 87 and also a part of the Chicago punk scene and have skated, um, the books had a profound resonance with me. As well as uh, due to some mental health issues in my own family and some very intense violence uh, from the time that I was from June of my seventh grade summer till November of my freshman year, I had no parents. So I would hang on street corners and steal food, so related to Marcus in a very personal way. And so um, getting all the way through the books and getting current with them, I thought as a fan of comics that it's one of the best comics that I've ever read because it, it, it just hit, it, there were a lot of ways for me to get into the world, into the stories that resonated with me very personally. As opposed to say a more higher concept story, it's more escapism. I felt like there were moments of escapism in there, but really all of those moments were just shining a mirror on grounded human moments. Oh, you're also co-running co -running the show. Yes. So how is that process like, working with Rick Miles and Jack? My role is to protect um, and serve Rick's original version for the comics, but also the development process that Rick and Miles went through to bring it to life. And so I felt incredibly honored and grateful to have been brought into the Korean team. And my role is to completely serve the books and to protect them creatively. How is it all of the cast trying to find the perfect characters for TV? So I came on after the pilot was shot, but I can tell you, um, having met the cast and, and spent a considerable amount of time with them, um, how excited they are and how much of it is less about um, any, any moments of ego as opposed to just being these characters and serving them in the stories and the books. You know, every, everybody down to the production assistants up to the number one on the 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 stars of the show, have, there, there's a culture of um, inclusiveness and encouragement to just be yourself and whatever you're creating work is, whatever, you know, whatever you're doing on the show, that you understand you're protected so that you're more coming back home and more down. Music plays a really intricate role in the graphic novels. Will we see that translate over to the screen as well? 100%. Very specific music. Yeah. Some really cool guest stars that I can't really discuss right now that will come in that are very era specific in ways that I think are going to probably turn some of your expectations on their heads a little bit. You know, kind of um, casting against type, which we really enjoy doing. I mean, we really want to present the stories in the world as, oh, I think I know this. I've, I've seen this story before. We know what this is and then turn that on its head. I mean, ideally, everybody tries to do that when you're telling these types of stories, but we've really committed to doing it over and over and over again so that you're consistently in surprise while remaining loyal and true to the books. Mm -hmm. You said that you were a part of the whole scene with Jeff while watching it being brought on to the TV screen. Do you feel you guys did it just, or did you have to kind of Hollywood it up? No, I don't think it was Hollywood. And again, I, I, I've come on after the pilot, so we're actually, we start prep in two weeks, in two weeks from now. So we're starting, and so it's our job now to make sure that it's, um, this is pre-commercialization of all, uh, of punk, of the music. It was radical, it was defined, and we got to present that. We didn't want to sugarcoat it at all, but some of it was ugly, and so that's going to be on there as well. This is an honest, an honest depiction of that era, and the frustration of that era, and it mirrors what's happening right now. There's a huge radical moment bubbling up, and people are just back in time. 
fired for bullshit. You see? And, um, you know, I got a suit jacket on, but if you were going to go hit the street right now and cause a ruckus, man, I would have to take it off and join you. The Fear of Agent Orange are some of the three songs that are in the pilot. Yeah. What was one of those moments where you heard some music queue up and you're like, oh my god, I remember it. Yeah, we want to have that. We also, you know, we're also we want to do like, like, that moment is cool and we love that moment, but we want to do more. So we want to have B-sides, like if you're really down with the music, that like it wasn't necessarily the, the radio drop or even like something that you would hear like on an underground college station. It could just be, you know, a B-side cut on, on, on an EP that came out out of, out of, you know, the UK that one store within a three-state radius had and you had to go. It was like sneakerheads. You just had to go and thank you so much. You know, you had to go Kind of new business, and it was your world, and this was pre internet, so you had to talk about it, you couldn't tweet about it or snap stories about it, you had to go and be like, I saw this band, and they were called Naked Ray Gun, and they played with the rhythm, and they had this song called Rap Patrol, and I think they're gonna break up, they started a new band called Peg Boy, and then you'd be like, oh now I gotta find out about Peg Boy and Ray Gun. So that, you know, we want to create that, we, we want to expose people to the music, right? And they're like, oh, what is that? And also honor the people that were really down with the scene to go, wow, they really, they know this world and they know this music. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you really geeked out with Rick when you guys started talking about bands and oh, stuff? Oh, yeah, completely, yeah. He's, you know, I was on the scene, he was on the scene too, but he takes it to another level. <laughs> uh, like, I was in it, but I was, um, you know, there was a big kind of racial scene going on in, in the streets of Chicago where much like today, you know, some some hammer skins tried to invade the scene from Arizona and Texas. We had to knock a hand on that. <laughs> uh, there's a resurgence right now of nostalgia seeping into pop culture. You see it in TV, you see it in movies. So um, how would you say Deadly Class stands out amongst all of those other shows that are kind of setting themselves back in decades that we long for? Can you repeat the top of that, the, the first part of that question? Yeah, yeah. I think that like right now we're in an era where nostalgia yeah. is like we're really into it. So how does Deadly Class stand out amongst all the other shows that are also setting themselves back in different decades? I think the big difference is that we're not riding with euphoric recall where we're trying to make everything cute and pleasant and wasn't it an amazing time. 1992 was the highest crime rate on record. And so we're in 87, which is where our show starts, we're like bubbling up to that point to where really, you know, many people at this table might not remember, but they used to make radios in your car that you could take out because if you left them, people would steal them. Like, you couldn't have a radio in your automobile. And you're like, like, it was just like a full on. Right, and we're not going to sensationalize that, but we're going to lay that out as the way that the world really was and how difficult it really is to be a teenager and how lost you can feel and, and trying to find your tribe and what does that mean and, and how does it feel like when you should not, not when you step in and you save the day and you fight for the honor of your friends, but what happens when you don't and then you have to go back to where you live knowing that you should have stepped up and you did because we've all made those type of mistakes and that just being one example of many. And now you feel like I'm the worst friend ever. I'm never going to be able to be friends with that person again. And those are real. And those are the real moments that we lean into instead of the more euphoric, hero y type of tropes that are fine for some shows, just not for ours. Thank you. Because we're going to wrap up now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this it? You're just Okay. Thank you so much for your time.